Amen. I'd like to say good morning to each and every one of you, and a good morning to Oak Level Baptist Church and all of our friends and family and visitors, and we're so thankful that you allowed us to come into your place of listening. Uh, we appreciate the prayers that you've been praying for us, and I appreciate the uh, prayer requests that you've been sending in. Uh, we've been doing our best to uh, keep those uh, on our prayer list and place them in our prayer box here, as you can see at the, uh, the front of the altar. Um, I'll just uh, thank God for the beautiful day that the Lord has given us. What a beautiful day it is. And I thank God for uh, his goodness, for his mercy, uh, for the wonderful rain and his blessing. And uh, we just want to give him praise for allowing us to be here. And uh, what a joy it is to open the precious word of God. And I thank him for that uh, opportunity, this opportunity we have here today. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, is uh, I'd never want to forget to thank all those uh, that makes this possible. I, I fail to do that from time to time. And uh, we've got ladies here. We've got youth workers. We've got our uh, musicians. We have, uh, uh, we have our, our sound uh, director there. And I thank God for, uh, for him. And, uh, you know, we, time to time we have our visitors. And uh, we're so thankful for that. And uh, we're so thankful for, uh, for our uh, uh, singers that they come and uh, so thankful for them. And uh, every Sunday, the Lord has blessed us with uh, singers and uh, we're so thankful for them and uh, their effort that they could come to be a blessing to you and uh, most of all, honor and glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Brother uh, Scotty Vestal, we're excited to have him here today. And he's going to come in just a few moments from this. And I believe he's going to uh, sing a few songs, whatever the Lord lays on his heart. And uh, we're going to uh, come before his presence with singing and uh, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And uh, we're excited about Brother Scotty and his family. And I appreciate the work that they do here at Oak Level. And uh, you pray for him. I know he'll appreciate that. Uh, as prayer requests, please pray Oak Level, all, the, all those listening. Uh, pray for Brother Gary West. Brother Gary was taken to the hospital this morning. Uh, he is doing okay. He is uh, going through some uh, tests now. He was having some chest pains, but he is in a regular room, and uh, they're looking at doing a stress test tomorrow. Uh, so far, he everything's checked out. Uh, it's not showing to be his heart, but they want to rule all of that out. So please pray for him, and uh, excited to tell you that Brother Jerry Bird, he's back at his room at a huge Chatham Nursing Center. We're so thankful for that. And uh, good news from Miss Shirley Carter. Got to speak with her last night. And uh, it looks like maybe the doctor is wanting to send her home uh, towards the end of this week. So we're excited about that. And so thankful the Lord has answered prayers there. Got a call uh, also this week uh, uh, concerning Misty Lester. Uh, she had an issue there uh, this week and had to be taken to the hospital. Uh, her hip uh, come out of joint. So uh, it's very, very painful there. Uh, they've got that taken care of and she's at home resting. So uh, please pray for her as we have many other prayer requests and uh, God knows all those. And I know that you have at home uh, many prayer requests and continue to pray one for another. Pray for our nation. I know that you have. Uh, I have been uh, excited about some things, maybe direction of things that are, the way they're going. And uh, maybe here in a few weeks that we'll be able to assemble together in the house of the Lord. But uh, you, you help me pray about this. I would love to see we've had a good response and had people that were listening, maybe even at work, uh, that has to work. And uh, they're able to listen there and join in at the service. And also uh, people abroad. We've had some of our missionaries. Please pray for our missionaries. Brother David Delapaz, love you, brother. Pray, praying for you down there in the Philippines. All of our missionaries, please pray for them. He's been able to join us a couple of different times on the Facebook Live there. And we're excited about that. Now, I know nothing takes place being in the house of God, nor should it, to be surrounding yourself uh, by the people of God and the family of God. To bear one another's burdens and to worship together. That's what his house is for. Uh, you know, I, I, don't, uh, I don't believe that God wants a phone call. I think he wants a personal visit, amen. And I believe he'd want the same for his family. So uh, we're excited about that. But maybe also looking forward to a way of us continuing this ministry 
even after we assemble together. We would love to be able to do that. Uh, so you just help us pray about that among many other things, all right? Uh, two, I want to give you uh, the place that we'll be at in the message today. We'll be in 2 Samuel chapter number 12. 2 Samuel chapter number 12. And uh, you, you pray for us as the Lord uh, brings a message. So many different directions the Lord has taken us on uh, in this journey throughout the last couple of weeks as the Lord has laid these thoughts of this message on our heart, uh, but you pray that God would just bring us down to the place and to the road that God would have us to plow this morning, and uh, we would do so uh, in his obedience and in his word, amen? Uh, there will be no preaching, be no singing done to honor God, uh, except the Holy Spirit lead and guide and direct, and we need his presence today in the service. I want to tell you, listen, I love you. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, whenever I stand and preach a message, I want you to understand that he, he hits me first. And I have to apply it, and I have to deal with that in my life. And I'm just as fallible as any man or any woman that is here. We need the Word of God. We need the Holy Spirit. And thank God we've got a Savior that's sitting on the throne today, interceding for you and for me. So let us come together around the table of the Lord, worship Him, and join together and sup from the cup of the Lord today. Let us pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly bow before you. And God, we thank you this, another opportunity, Lord, that you've given us together in your house, Lord. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for what has taken place. God, and, uh, Lord, I know to the world it seems as foolishness, uh, but to us that are saved, it is the power of God. And Lord, we ask you, the Heavenly Father, to bless in the singing God, we thank you so much for our singers. God, I ask you bless them on each and every one of them. God, they've come and sung uh, for no other purpose but to honor and glorify you and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, truly this morning, that is our desire. God, to lift up Jesus Christ. Lord, I know the Heavenly Father, there are many hearts that are gathered uh, through Facebook, God, through YouTube, and God, other, other means, Lord, that will hear through the CD. God, one thing's for certain, we all stand in need of thy precious word. God, may it be a scalpel, Lord, that will go into our heart and cut away the things that need to be removed. God, that healing can take place, that we can mature as Christians, and Lord, we can grow stronger. But God, today, that one is walking, Lord, in a lost condition. They've never received Christ as their personal Savior. Lord, I pray to Heavenly Father that they would see that the wages of sin is death. But God, you sent one, Lord, that paid the sin debt and the sin penalty. And Lord, we thank you to Heavenly Father for your precious Son that you gave so freely on the cross at Calvary. Lord, he laid his life down, Lord. Not only did he lay his life down, he took it again on that third day. And because he lives, we can live. And Lord, that people would repent of their sin and the day and hour we live. We need a healing. Uh, truly, we need a healing on our land. But God, we understand and realize in Second Chronicles chapter 7, you tell us there's some things that's going to have to take place before that healing comes about. The Lord, repentance is going to have to come to the land. It's going to have to come to the United States. And Lord, may it first begin with us here in the house of God. Lord, as always, help us to decrease that Christ would increase. And we'll do our best to lift him up. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And amen. At this time, we'd ask Brother Scotty to come. And I believe he's going to be playing the piano for you today. Uh, this is a man of many talents. Amen. He's, he's been known to play two or three instruments at one time. But you pray for him, and I know God will use him to bless your heart. thinking about 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 this week and it says but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear and I was thinking about the, the, the others in this world having to ask us about that hope and what are we doing to make others to ask us you know we're no doubt in some very scary times right now we're going through we see the news and 
and all the uncertainty, and, and just to be quite honest with you, people were scared, and, uh, and rightfully so. Uh, but we are called, uh, as Christians, the church, we are called to, to, to be uh, yes. and show uh, the world hope in our lives, so much so that people should be asking us for that reason. Yes, right. I just want to share with you the reason where my hope comes from this morning in song.
Well, what a glorious day it'll be we get to see him again. It'll be a glorious day we get to meet again, assemble ourselves, and not take it for granted. Uh, preacher King, yes, sir. the assembling together of ourselves. Uh, but what a glad reunion day it's going to be, a uh, glorious day it's going to be when we get to see those that uh, we haven't seen in a while. Uh, that's a glorious day. But I'm, I'm looking forward to another glorious day. That's what I get to see when I say yes, Jesus Christ. Yes. The name of this next song is Glorious Day.
Uh, I'm like you, Brother Scotty, that's here at 50 years old. And you got a lot of friends, you got a lot of loved ones. Even since we've been here at Oak Level, how we watched the saints of God move on to glory. And God's doing the work. And you know what He's doing? Uh, he's gathering His bride. He's gathering His church. Amen. And it's not going to be long until He assembles the bride in heaven. And He calls His church to ever be with Him in the air. I'm looking forward to that glorious day. Amen. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to have a body that will be able to stand it. Amen. Because God, God's going to give us a body likened unto the Son of God. We're excited about that. I do ask you to pray for us as we look into uh, the message, look into the scripture today, and uh, I pray for you. I pray that God would open all of our hearts together, that we would uh, just be honest, be honest with ourselves, be honest with a God that is all-knowing and all-seeing. He already knows everything about us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows what we need today, and yes, He knows what we need tomorrow. Uh, and as we have uh, looked into the passage of Scripture, it reminds me of a very important fact. Um, the Word of God is given for our instruction, for reproof, for, uh, for direction, for correction, uh, for our learning. Uh, God has given it to us for that. And the Bible is described in the Word of God as being sharper than any two-edged sword. And uh, that sword, it, 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 any time that it works, it performs a cut, doesn't it? Now, I don't know about you, it don't take much of a cut before uh, I turn uh, into a baby. You know, I, it's, uh, I'm all right with blood as long as it's somebody else's. Uh, uh, but whenever it's mine, it's, it's, it's different, it seems like it. Uh, but, uh, you know, that pain, uh, it subsides. And a lot of times in our life, you know, it, it, there's people that has to, to go through surgeries, to have to have the doctors uh, being used by God to, to perform healing. And they have to go through surgeries, and they have to go through rehabilitation. You know, there's some cutting, and there's some pain, and some healing that has to take place. But the end result, and that's what I want us to see this morning, the end result of that, having to go through that, it means that you're able to live a better life. You're able to live a longer and more fulfilled life whenever that happens. And I see that many times in the Word of God, the way it comes to my heart and the way it has to prune and the way it has to instruct and the way it has to direct. I thought many times growing up, and you know, Mama would send me after my own hickory and, and you know, she would say, now, you don't understand how much this hurts me to have to do that. She was absolutely right. I did not understand what she was meaning. But as i grown older, I understand that there was a lot of love, more love in the instruction, and then more love in the whippings and the, the, the discipline that mom gave me than if she would have just turned me loose and let me go. Well, I thank God we have a heavenly father that loves us enough to direct us. And he gives us his word and his Holy Spirit to do that. Now, we're not trying to, to be long. We want to stay on point, and you pray that we do that. And we want to look in the first 14 verses of chapter number 12 of 2 Samuel. Now, I do want to bring you to where we're at. That way we can put it in context before we read our text. We've got to understand where we're at in the word of God. And uh, what we're dealing with uh, is the life of David. Now, I, I trust if you've been around church any length of time, you know who King David is. And we look back and we see a mighty man of valor that King David was. Even before that, we see him as a young shepherd boy, as his anointed king over Israel. At the time, Saul was the king, appointed by man and allowed by God. But the man that God would have to be the ruler over Israel was little David. And David uh, proved his uh, reliance on the Lord even on the battlefield as a young lad uh, there as he defeated Goliath. Uh, do you remember that story? But here now in the passage of Scripture, we find a different, uh, different time in David's life. David has been king now uh, for quite some time. Uh, he's rose to fame. He's rose in power. And uh, something's happened in David's life. If I would ask you um, what are two things that you remember about King David, 
I would say it would probably go something like this. First of all, uh, he was known as a man after God's own heart. Uh, we, that's amazing to be uh, titled that, a man after God's own heart. Uh, but I believe the second point that, that, that he would be known by and remembered by was the, the topic that we're dealing with today. And that is the sin with Bathsheba. And that's what we're dealing at. And it's known as David's great sin. As you look at the previous chapter 11, and I'll encourage you, if you're not familiar with the, the story of that, to read over what has happened. It was a time whenever the kings were uh, to be at war, but David chose to stay back uh, at the king's palace. He went up on top of the king's palace as, after he had rose from his bed, and he looked down and he saw a woman, and she was bathing. And you know what? He did not uh, just turn away. He began to inquire about this woman and who she was and found out that it was Uriah, the Hittite's wife. Uriah, he was out uh, with the king's army, Joab, where actually King David ought to be. Uriah was out on the battlefield fighting the king's battle. Uh, but yet we see he inquired about this lady by the name of Bathsheba. He also not only inquired about her, he sent after her. And then the Bible said that he brought her in to his chamber and he committed adultery uh, there with Bathsheba. Uh, Bathsheba went back home and sent word to the king that she had conceived and now she is with child. So here, just like sin, what happens? Uh, we start working a good cover-up, don't we? Uh, the old King David calls for Uriah. He's developed this little uh, trick and, and uh, scheme that he's going to try to cover up the sin. Uh, he brings her husband home and uh, tells her husband to go uh, into his wife, go into his house. Uh, but we see uh, the great, uh, great uh, uh, reputation and the great loyalty of Uriah. He would not go uh, with his brethren out on the battlefield and the ark of God dwelling in tents. He would not go into his wife, but yet slept there at the doorstep of the king's castle. Uh, but then we see that uh, David realized he wasn't going to treat Uriah that way. Uh, so his next step was to send a letter by the hand of Uriah back out into the battlefield uh, to the leader of the army, Joab. And that letter instructed Joab to send Uriah to the heat of the battle and withdraw himself from him that he may be killed. So now we started uh, out, out on top of the castle. He started out with lust. And he inquired. He, he, he gave into that lust and started inquiring. Gave place to Satan inquiring about Bathsheba. Come in and it turned into adultery. Now we've seen adultery turn into murder. We see the progressiveness of sin and the way sin will take you farther than you want to go. But Uriah now is dead. He's killed on the battlefield. The word is sent back to David. I believe David took a deep breath and thought, well, it's all taken care of now. He sent for Bathsheba after her mourning, brought her in, married Bathsheba, and there that child was to be born as his own. So he thought he had worked a good cover-up, didn't he? Oh, many times we, we find ourselves, that's human nature, isn't it? It seems like we're, it's everybody else's fault, isn't it? Uh, nobody else knows, but we're about to find out differently in our text today. We want to do our best and handle the Word of God respectfully, but we want to preach to you a message that's needed not only in my life, in my home, in my church, in my nation, but yeah, in everybody's life uh, throughout the world. The, the, the title of the message this morning is Consequences of Sin. Consequences of of sin. Now after this, the Bible picks up there in verse number one. The Bible says, now Nathan is a prophet of the Lord. Uh, God is at the last verse there in, in uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11. That uh, says that this grieved and displeased the heart of the Lord, right? So we see that God in verse number one has sent his prophet named Nathan. The Bible said in the word of God, and the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, 
But the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was coming to him. But took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he had did this thing and because he had no pity. Watch verse number seven. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thou saith the Lord God, thou, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives unto thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thy house because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. But pay close attention. Verse number 14 says, How be it? Because by this deed, Thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Dear Lord, we're before you. We're your instrument. Without you, I can do nothing. Illuminate our thoughts. Put spiritual blinders on our eyes that we may preach your word. And help us to do our part. Help me to do my part. And take it and apply it to my life. And we'll give you praise for what you accomplished in Christ's name. Amen. And amen. You know, every time I read this passage of Scripture, and these two chapters, my heart breaks for David. For here was a man that God was able to use. And God did use greatly. But yet a man that is lifted up and God has lifted up, uh, you know, oftentimes we've seen it uh, happen many times. That people that are an example, uh, people that can be a powerful example, and it seems like Satan goes doubly hard to try to tear down those folk. Oh my goodness, all it would take is you uh, just admitting that every time that you try to get closer to God and you try to live for God, and daddy, every time that you try uh, to nurture and you try to bring your family under the umbrella of the Word of God, it seems like Satan will open up uh, every portal and every avenue that he can get in, and he'll come in and try to do what he does best, and that is to steal and to kill and to destroy. You know, I thank God that for sin, I praise the Lord, there is a remedy today for sin. Before we go any farther, I want to tell you that I thank God we have a Savior and his name is Jesus Christ. And he died on the cross at Calvary to pay a sin debt that I could not pay. And that sin debt, the wages of sin is death. I want you to understand that. Now the wages of a sin is a debt that we cannot pay. Now for one thing is for certain. We've heard it said many times that there is no big sin or no little sin when it comes to God. We're going to deal with that a little more in depth today. 
I understand what people are saying when they say that. As far as God's concerned and the separation between us and the fellowship with God, nor what requires us to be found a sinner. It makes no difference what sin it is that you commit uh, to make you a sinner. Uh, but I'm going to tell you, uh, there is a difference. Listen close. And I want you to hear me. I want you to hear from someone that knows what he's talking about. Uh, there is a difference than the payment of sin and the consequences that come along with sin. You know, we're oftentimes real quick to quote 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 9. I love this passage of Scripture. There's not a truer verse of Scripture found in the Word of God. But please do not err in trying to make this verse say something that it does not. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 9, If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Boy, is that not a beautiful picture of the word of the blood of Jesus Christ. How He comes into a heart that is dirty because of sin. And He'll wash that heart and wash that old black heart and make it whiter than snow. Amen. Take that old dead heart out and put you a thumping living heart that'll live and breathe and feel and love and then it hurt whenever you get cut. And God's able to do that. He's able to clean up even the vilest of sinners. But I'm here to tell you, listen, uh, there is a something that goes along with sin that Satan does not want you to know about. The Word of God would have me to tell you here today that not only is the payment of sin is death, and Jesus Christ for the child of God has paid that sin debt that we may be one with, together with God, that that payment that God required would be whole. I uh, thank God for the blood of Jesus. But you know what? There's some things that come along in this life with sin. Those things are called consequences. Preacher, what are you talking about? Well, I just want to give you as a, as a little example. If you was to get out on the highway today and start going down the road and you're, you're, you're running uh, 10 or 15 miles over the speed limit, there's a good chance. Uh, that one of our troopers or one of our uh, law enforcement officers are going to see an opportunity to check off a box. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Uh, but what he's going to do, he's going to light you up. He's going to pull you over. He's going to come at you with a smile. He's going to come at you and he just give you a word of encouragement to slow down. And he's going to take a, a, his stripe and pin out. And he's going to write you a ticket that you're going to have to pay for and then you're going to go on your way. What happened is that you have broken the law. Uh, you, you have committed an infraction against the law of the land. And you're going to have to pay a price for that. But if you get in that same vehicle. And that vehicle is reported stolen. And you've stolen that vehicle. And you take off down the road. And you go about uh, causing all sorts of mayhem. And you cause a wreck down here. And a life is lost. Now things is totally different, amen? You are in a vehicle and you're driving that vehicle. But because of the level of sin and because of the violation that you have committed, it comes with a heavier consequence, amen? It comes with a heavier consequence. What are you saying, preacher, right here? The consequence of the sin, not only of adultery, but also the sin of murder come with heavy consequences, I want you to understand that today, no matter what sin it is, there's consequences that come with that sin. And we're going to look at a few things that's found in the Word of God. First of all, I want us to look there found uh, hidden embedded in verse number one. I want, you, I want you to look at the first point that the Word of God would have us to look at. The Bible says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto who? No, it sent Nathan unto David. Amen? Oh my goodness, I'd love to, uh, to preach just a little while about how you can't hide sin. Amen? Listen, he thought he had it hid. Uh, from, he did have it hid uh, from everybody else except him and Bathsheba. 
Uh, but they was one that see all, know all, understand all, and hears all. Amen. There's a God on the throne uh, that nothing is hidden from. Uh, but I want you to look. Uh, God sent his man, a man by the name of Nathan. I don't know how much uh, that God let Nathan in on. Uh, but I believe that he let in on enough to understand uh, uh, there was something darn wrong. Uh, there's something desperately wrong in the king's life. Uh, but notice he sent Nathan. Uh, if you'll like it to Nathan, and I would appreciate uh, this morning and I believe you'd love me uh, just a little bit better uh, preaching a message like this uh, if you would understand uh, old Nathan, uh, all he is uh, and all he was uh, was just a mailman. Uh, the mailman uh, has an unpaid bill uh, that is brought to you. Uh, old Nathan uh, had an unpaid bill uh, that was being brought to Nathan, uh, uh, excuse me, brought to David uh, uh, that day. I want you to hear, I uh, want you to understand uh, I love you with all my heart. And if there's ever been a preacher that can place himself down there on the floor, prostrate before God, as you're looking at him this morning, it's not by anything good that I've got. But I'm telling you what God's saying this morning. I'm telling you I love. And I'm listening with my own heart. First of all, I want us to see this was the king. Amen. Oh, King David uh, was the one that Nathan had went to uh, from God announcing his sin and the sin that had taken place. Uh, the first thing I want you to see, I don't know who you are. And I don't know your last name. Well, I don't know where you come from, where you work, uh, or what you've been through. Uh, that's the good thing about preaching the Word of God. Uh, you can just cut it and let the chips fall where it may because we all, uh, we all are in a need this morning. Uh, uh, listen, the first thing I want you to see, uh, uh, this was the king, a uh, uh, man after God's own heart, uh, uh, the top dog in the land. Uh, he had failed in the trap of Satan and fell in the sin. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that all have sin and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says over in Romans 3, verse number 23, for all have sin and come short of the glory of God. That's all inclusive this morning. That does not leave one out. Oh my, listen, there's, there's people here I don't believe that because of their real estate, they've never reached that place of accountability. There's, a, there's some of our young children that's not yet reached that place of accountability. What are you talking about, preacher? Do you know what God has instilled in every man, every woman, boy, and girl? God has instilled in you a conscience. And what that conscience will do, uh, that conscience will tell you whether something's right or something's wrong. I believe this with all my heart. Uh, the last one, I mean the last one that God has convicted, God's convicted people of sin. They're the last ones you've got to go to and tell them they messed up. God does a good job of his work, amen. Whenever he sends the Holy Ghost of God after you, amen, he's got a search warrant uh, uh, straight from heaven. He'll bring uh, that knock on your heart's door uh, just as Nathan knocked uh, on the king's palace. Uh, God sent it after him. He'll send it after us, amen. Hey, God's not a respecter of person, nor is sin. Nor is sin. Sin's not. I want you to look back even in the Garden of Eden we find that because of one man's sin, because of Adam there, as he, uh, he stood there beside his wife and gave place to the devil that the devil would treat his wife. And he stood there and allowed that to go on. Not only did he allow it to go on, he partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil also. And because of his disobedience, sin came into the world. And whenever sin entered into Adam, sin nature has been passed down throughout the years. I want you to see uh, you're a sinner this morning. If you've never been saved by the grace of God, you're a sinner this morning. Uh, because not of all the bad things that you have done, not because you didn't try hard enough. You're a sinner this morning because it is in your nature to sin. It's been handed down generation after generation. It is in your nature to sin. If you don't believe that, I believe this with all my heart. Uh, you, could, you could take a family that would go out 
an awesome word. Uh, I love to do that sometimes. And, uh, and raise a family right on top of a mountain all by yourself and just raise that family. You know, a child can be born into that family. Mom and dad do everything right and try to and, 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 and talk right, act right, live right in front of that child. Do you know what that child will do whenever he gets up to about two or three years old? He'll start being disobedient. He'll sure do it. Hey man, that, that, if you tell that child not to do something, he's going to look at you out of the corner of his eye. He's going to slip over and try to do it. Hey man, if you don't believe that, you stand just a little. We're never able to do that. You go down to Walmart, you stand there at the toy aisle. Hey man, you'll see what I'm talking about. Hey man, you don't have to teach a young man how to do wrong, how to lie, how to cheat, how to steal. Hey man, if parents, it's your responsibility to teach the children the word of God the right way. I had a conversation there with one of our elders this week uh, talking about some things there. And I said, you know what? God's accomplishing a lot in the day and the time that we live in. One of the things that God is accomplishing, and listen to this, God's uh, forcing the parents that have had children to start being a parent. You can't shut it. Hey, man, I got, I got those that are here are not read. Hey, man. Hey, listen, you can't shove that child off to the daycare and to the school system. And the coach don't have him uh, from 5 o'clock till 9 o'clock. And you don't stick him in front of the TV until and, and bedtime and never spend any time with him. Hey, some people today uh, ready for school to start back, amen. Uh, why is that? Uh, because at least, you know what, uh, it ought to encourage people to do. Uh, amen. It ought to encourage uh, and show you just exactly what you're doing. And rearing your children, amen. I believe there's some children figuring out what discipline is all about. I believe there's some uh, parents figuring out what that rear ends for and still just to set on, amen, the last several weeks, amen. We weren't going to get into that, but I believe that's good knowledge too, amen. Amen, we need to be about that. Hey, spare the rod, you hate the child, amen. Not spoil the child, you hate the child. That was a free one right there. But all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Notice that. We're all in need of forgiveness of sin. Amen. And also we're all in need of being aware that we're susceptible to sin. Just because you've been saved by the grace of God does not mean that you will not sin. You will sin and you'll do it every day. Amen. Even the Apostle Paul said, I have to die daily because of sin. On the inside, thank God, we've got a spiritual man now that is saved by the grace of God. And that's in there saying, Keith, you better not do that. And Keith, you shouldn't have done that. You better call and tell him that you're sorry. You don't need to do this. And all the time, on the inside, the Holy Spirit's telling me all the things that I ought to do. And old Keith on the outside, he's just going the way of the world. And going on his feelings and going on what he wants to do and suppresses that. You know what happens for him that knoweth to do good. How do you know it? Because the Holy Spirit is telling you and the Word of God is the standard that tells you what sin is. Except for the law of the Word of God we would not have known sin. And God's given those guidelines through the Holy Spirit and in His Word. But listen, we've all sinned and come short the glory of God. We must move on the Bible says over there I want us to look in verse number 5 and 6 there's something else happening right here amen uh, Nathan tells a story hey, uh, he uses it as an example he said there was a rich man that had a, a whole bunch of lambs and a whole bunch of crops he had everything but his neighbor down here he was just a poor man all he had was this one little ewe lamb but there's something about that little ewe lamb. He loved that ewe lamb with all of his heart. He, he, he would die for that lamb. He raised that lamb as his daughter. He ate of his meat. And he was so precious to this man. Nathan said, let me tell you what this rich man did. Rich man had a friend that come from a distance. That's customary. He was responsible of the, the, uh, the uh, inviting party that welcomed the guest in to provide food. For him. So instead of that wealthy man going and taking of his plenty, he goes over to his neighbor and he grabs that little ewe lamb out of his clutches and takes it for force and takes it for his own. He slays that little ewe lamb just because he wanted it, but he had all these others. 
Boy, my, you see what happened when they, David heard that? David being a just king. Amen. He knew what the law of God said. He knew what the word of God said. He knew that was wrong. But something happened, didn't it? What happened? The blindness of our sin. The blindness of sin. Verse 5 and 6, the Bible says, And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he had done this thing, and, and because he had no pity. Notice that, the blindness of sin, the blindness of sin. I jotted this down. I, wanna, I want you to listen to this quote. This quote says this, you know you have gone blind when you can see nothing wrong with something God has called sin. You're blinded by sin whenever you can look at something that God has said was sin and we will not stand up and call it sin. Ain't it amazing, Brother Scotty, how it is, it's awful easy to see other people's faults. Just as David looked on the story of that rich man, how he stole that little lamb, he didn't realize God wasn't talking about a lamb. And God was talking about him. And God was talking about how he went over to Uriah's house and stole Uriah's heart and took the wife Bathsheba to his own and went out and had Uriah killed. He wasn't able to see that. He sure was able to see the death of that little lamb. Why? Because it's a whole lot easier to see somebody else's faults than it is your own. It's a whole lot easier to see someone else's sin than our own. You know, as we look around today, we see things that's happening in the world. And I don't believe this. There, there's consequences don't come for no reason whatsoever. Consequences. And we talked about storms over the last several weeks. Storms come from all directions and for many different purposes. But I'm telling you, the greatest storms and the most storms that I've had in my life are consequences of decisions of things that I have did that was against the word of God and things that I didn't do that God had told me I ought to do. You know what? It's time, it's high time that we step up and we assume the responsibility. Listen, the only way we can move, move forward as God's people and as a nation and as a world is if we quit looking for somebody to bail us out and quit looking for somebody else to blame and start standing up and say, look, uh, the circumstances uh, that we're in today uh, is because uh, we've been blinded to the sin that we've been in. Preacher, preacher, what are you talking about? I'm talking about a time and an era that we lived in. This is not, this is not a secret, amen. Uh, this is not something that's been uh, hit up on the shelf. Uh, uh, God's brought it by uh, uh, through preaching uh, uh, time and time again. Uh, uh, but how long uh, have we as a country uh, uh, stood back uh, uh, being blind uh, uh, to things that God's Word has called sin? We've snuggled up next to uh, the sin of homosexuality and lesbianism uh, to the point uh, to where we gave it a new name and called it an alternative lifestyle. Amen. I'm preaching to you this morning uh, uh, that not Keith. Uh, uh, Keith is not, uh, he's not the one uh, only that says it's sin. Uh, uh, the one that says it's sin uh, is God Almighty. Uh, it's been sin uh, uh, from the foundation of the world uh, and it's sin from now on. Uh, uh, but that's not the only sin. We find it over there in Romans chapter number one. Uh, there the whole chapter of the Bible speaks of a time whenever uh, the people would turn from the things of God. Uh, they would look to all the worldly pleasures, uh, even to the point, uh, I thank you for asking I'll turn over there and read it for you. I appreciate that. Uh, the Bible said, uh, nobody did that. The Lord just told me to do that. But, <laughs> but watch this. The Bible says over here, Romans chapter 1. I want to read verse the last, uh, excuse me, let's, let's read the last four verses. The Bible says, being filled with all unrighteousness, 
fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God. You know, backbiters, amen. How long us as a church have we sat back and we've hidden our eyes and we quit looking at backbiting and gossiping as sin, amen. Uh, people, listen, uh, we quit coming to the altar and talking to God about those that are fallen in iniquity. Uh, we would rather call uh, old Sadie Sand a uh, sad face uh, and tell them uh, all about what they're doing, amen. Oh my goodness, that's just as much sin. Sure it is. I'm telling you what, well, there's some consequences to sin that we need to look at. And the Bible says also there, the Bible says over there, as we was reading in Romans chapter number one, it said, without understanding, verse number 31, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, Without that, that's natural affection, the way God had cre created man to be with a woman and a woman to be with a man. Amen? That's what God's talking about. Amen? God deals with it many different places of Scripture. Do you know what God said? He's, this is how bad that it's got. Not only are they backbiting, not only are they malicious, not only are they hard-hardened, they went as far as for men to lie with men and women to women. They're going to multiply. Do you really think that us as, as a nation and God's people could continue to slaughter thousands upon thousands of unborn innocent children that God had placed in the womb and us not go through the consequences of that? And listen, I would love to stand up here to tell you and preach to you how uh, God is going to send a miracle uh, by the way of a vaccine and you're, not, you're going to go uh, to the beach and you're going to have a good time. Uh, the beach is not what you need. We have to get back uh, to a place of repentance. Amen. Amen. Because there's consequences. There's innocent ones. There are people that are suffering today because of sin. I want to get this last point over here. Amen. Listen, we've been blinded. We've been blinded. We've not seen. That's not my brother. It's not my sister. It's me. I started condoning. I started looking at things that God calls sin and not calling it sin. One of the big, biggest tactics of Satan, he will infiltrate the school systems. He will infiltrate the, the radios. Uh, he will infiltrate the TVs. It will be on every commercial. It's sick, sick into my stomach. Hey, man, listen, it's just as sickening to watch these little girls running around here uh, with clothes on about the size of a postage stamp. Hey, man, that's sickening also. That's sin too. Hey, man, there's a lot of sin out there. Anything that God says is wrong is sin. Hey, man. But the Bible says, look, Verse 31, Romans chapter 1 says, Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and merciful, who knowing the judgment of God, there's no escape of that. If you know God, you know the judgment of God. He's going to bring judgment on sin. That they which commit such things are worthy of death. See that? That's the judgment of God. They that uh, which commit such things are worthy of death. But they not only do the same, Watch this now. But have pleasure in them that do them. They're, they're not only, watch now, they're not only doing those things out there in the world, but they're also ones that are having pleasure in them that do them. What does that mean? That means not only are people out in a world of sin sinning, now we've got people agreeing that it's okay. Amen. People are saying that it's all right. Well, you say, preacher, I've never said all that filthiness and all that sin's all right. Well, how many times have you stood up out of the love of God and proclaimed uh, to a world uh, that it's wrong and we need to turn back to God? Amen. That's what I want to see. I want to see somebody just step out and get some of those uh, people out of that uh, that uh, update uh, there about 5.36 o'clock every evening and get those people that ain't got nothing to say out of the way and let a leather nun, uh, a leather one uh, preacher stand up there and say, look, uh, we need to understand. We need to turn back to God. Amen. Amen. We need that. Nathan looked to David. Him being the king. Brought the word of God and said, Thou art the man, blindness of sin. But not only that, notice this last point here. 
we find in verse number 10 and verse number 14. We want to look at verse number 14 first. And we not only have we seen that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, we've also seen the blindness of sin. How that Satan can blind us to the things that we think, oh, we have justified it. Hey, man, we have, we, you know, if you look hard enough, you're going to find somebody that will agree with you that it's okay. But you know, right and wrong is not determined by how many people says it's right and wrong. Right and wrong is not determined by what the law of the land is. And the right and wrong is not determined about the, uh, by the lawyers and the judges of this land. I'm going to tell you what determines right and wrong is what thus saith the Word of God. Amen. And listen, if our laws of our land does not line up with the Word of God, we need to want them out and throw them away. Now just because uh, uh, something's legal, that does not make it right. Amen. Amen. God calls it sin. It's sin. And it's going to be sin whenever this world is on fire. And it's own judgment. It's going to be sin. Amen. Oh, I love you with all my heart. I want you to understand not only all of sin, there's a blindness that comes with sin, but there's also a price of sin. There's a price of sin. We find that. We find a, a price of sin that's immediate in this situation here with David. There's an immediate cost and immediate price. Now the Bible says right here, verse number 14, how be it because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. What are you saying, preacher? What I'm telling you, listen, I'm speaking to the church for just a little while. The Bible tells us over there in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Hey, listen, you know where it's going to have to start? You know, revival and repentance is going to have to start in this land. It's going to have to start with the church, amen? Hey, you know what we're going to have to be? We're going to have to be separate. We're going to have to be different. We're going to have to look different, talk different, act different, go to different places, raise your children different, speak different, sing different, talk different, amen? Amen, be a difference, amen? That people would come and see Jesus Christ through your life. I'm telling you what, there's a price of sin. And you know what? For a child of God, it's a great price. And because a child of God is put in a place to where you, you, you wear in the name of Christ. That's why they call you Christian. You're wearing the name of Christ and whenever we falter and whenever we fail and we fail to stand up and we fail to call sin, sin, do you know what we're doing? We're giving occasion for Satan and the enemy to bring shame on the name of Christ. You can either be a good example or a bad example, but you'll be an example one way or the other. Amen. Don't let Satan use you uh, to tear the, tear the name of Christ down. There's no wonder that Satan is trying to tear down the men of God that will stand and pray. The women that, listen, you keep on keeping on. You keep on going on. Amen. There's some godly women uh, that's come to set the house of God uh, several years uh, after praying for their husband, praying for their children, praying that God will move. Don't you give up. Amen. There's a reward waiting on you. Don't you turn back now. Hey, God, here's your prayer. I'm telling you what, there's a price, an immediate price for David was the life of that child that was born to Bathsheba. And him was the one that was uh, born and conceived out of wedlock, conceived in adultery. He said, your sins have been removed. What that is, is if you remember 1 John 1, 9, his sin was forgiven. But because of what you've done, there's something going to have to happen. I want you, and this is something that Satan does not want you to know. I want you to understand there is pleasure in sin for a season. Satan will not show you the cost of sin. He will not show you the consequences of sin. I want you to understand uh, Satan pays in counterfeit money. It's no good to you. It'll destroy you. And those things that sin brings to you is going to be death and death in many forms. Spiritual death. Testimonial death. The death of a home. The death of a, a reputation. The death of your influence. The death of your future. The death of your hope. 
Preacher, what are you saying? Are you saying that once I've sinned, there's no hope? Absolutely not. I thank God. Listen, you know, for a child of God, you know one thing that he gives you? Not only will he give you forgiveness, there's a lot of other things that God has for his children. Amen? I want you to look. God will give you strength. Amen? God will give you grace. God, you know, I believe this. I, I, don't, I believe for those hearts, I, what determines, I think, the consequences of sin is, is the, the, the sin itself that's committed because, you know, there's, there's some things that really just, it hurts everybody, but it's, it's more limited in a small core. Then there's sins that's got a ripple effect. It just goes out, and, it's, and you know what? I believe the length, the length of the time that sin is committed, I believe continual death is piled, and consequences. The longer, it's the same way. It's, if you've got a shibboleth, you know what it is to have rust. And but if you if you ignore that rust in that Chevrolet, you come back and two weeks later, you'll be picking it up. And no, I said that as a joke. But you don't ignore that because it grows. It does not go away. The only way you can cure that, you can't spray stuff on it. <laughs> I'm talking about a car dealer tactic, can't I? But you you have to cut that out, and you got to put new back in its place. Amen. That'll remove the sin. Well, that's what God wants to do to his children. That's what God wants to do to those that are lost. Amen. Oh my goodness. We see, we see the immediate consequence of sin. But yet there was a, a great sin also. The, the, the great consequence that's not talked about a lot. And that is a, a lifelong consequence or a long term consequence. And we find that in verse number 10. Now therefore the sword shall never depart out of thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, to be thy wife. I'd encourage you to read on in the next several chapters. The very next chapter, you'll find it's already started to happen. It's already started to happen. And they, a daughter by the name of Tamar, David's daughter, was raped by her half-brother Amnon. Not only that, uh, Am, uh, Absalom, uh, he laid in wait. Absalom was another one of the brothers. He brought Tamar in and he said, don't you open your mouth, don't say a word about this. I believe it was two years later that Absalom fell on his brothers. All these, this is David's family. Absalom had his servants fall on Amnon and kill him. Absalom, uh, the, the one that, you know, during this whole time, the Bible, if you'll read that, you'll see many times where all David done was bowed down and wept. When he heard of the death of Amnon, he wept. Whenever Absalom fled, fled from the, king, the presence of the king because of what he had done, he wept. When, when Absalom come back and begged to see the king, I believe the king was in his chambers weeping over what had happened. And you know what? Uh, uh, that, that, uh, Absalom, he rose up in power and had many to come trying to overthrow David, his own son. You know what? David wept. Do you know what I believe he was weeping over? I believe he was weeping over what we read in verse number 10. Not only, brother, what Absalom, what Amnon, what happened to the Tamar, what's even happening now in the children of Israel, not only that was he weeping over, but I believe he was weeping over it all come. All of this is brought about because of my sin, because of what I have done. Preachers of that grave, absolutely it is. There's great consequences. But I want to tell you some good news, amen. I believe this with all my heart. If you'll turn to God, if you'll turn to God, repent of your sin, and turn back to Jesus Christ, and you know what I believe God will do? God, God will lessen, God will lessen the consequences. I believe that. I, be, I believe He will lighten the consequences. There'll still be consequences. But I don't believe there'll be as grave a consequence. I know they won't. It's if you'd continue on your sin. See, David in all his rights should have been killed. He should have been stoned to death. But God saved his life. But yet one of the innocent ones, the small child, had to suffer. Small child had to, I've been asked that question, and I know you have asked that question yourself many times. Preacher, why does, it, does God allow the innocent of this world to suffer? You know, the only answer that I, I come up with, and I, I don't pretend to understand everything in my mind, that is the sheer ugliness of what sin is. It's a consequence of sin. 
And every time I went to God and prayed and asked God, why is it that a child, why is it that an elder, why is it that someone that it really has no dog in the fights having to pay for this? Why is someone innocent having to suffer for the sins of someone guilty? And every time, whenever that rolls out of my mouth, the Lord takes me to a place called Calvary. And he shows me his blessed son that hung between heaven and earth. And he says, I know what you're talking about. And then I've got to bow my head in shame and understand God has a purpose and there is a reason. Oh my goodness, look right here. We see, there's three, we talked about storm. Don't, do you believe this? Do you believe that sin can bring a storm in your life? It does, doesn't it? There's three things that a sin storm will do in your life. You know, I, I love these spring storms. I love to hear the thunder and uh, watch the lightning and, and, uh, and, and hear the rain. But as a small child, it would scare me. But we've heard some awful devastation of, of tornadoes and, and people losing their lives. Whenever a storm of that magnitude comes through, there's some things that happen. The first thing that usually happens over at my house, I'm not going to tell you what company I'm with, but the first thing that will happen is the power will go out. The power goes out. I'm talking spiritually this morning. Whenever a, a sin storm comes your way, the consequences show up. First thing that happens, power goes out. You know, I, 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 my power went out here the other day. It rained just a little bit. It went out for six hours. I called and I said, I need, I need something. First thing I done, amen, I took, took a bath with an aquafina bottle of water and went on to work. But I called them. I said, I, I need you to get out there. We were, we're geared to work what? We can't function without the power. Amen. It runs the air, air it runs the heat, it runs the microwave, it runs the TV, it runs your computer. Amen. It won't take you long to run that battery dead. We need that. Amen. As a child of God, the first thing, your first goal, whenever a sin storm comes through your life, the first goal should be read the psalmist David. Search me and try me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Your first job, your first desire should be to get the power back in your life. Get the power of God back in your life. They said another thing that's going to happen. You know what? I, I remember Hugo coming through. That hurricane come through. Never thought it, a hurricane would be up here in North Carolina. But I remember 20 years later, you could still walk through the woods Maybe even now in some places, and you can see remnants of trees that were blown over. Debris, you look at some of those tornadoes that come through hurricane and, and some of those storms, uh, you know, destroying crops. There's trees, there's, there's houses exploded, and debris is laying everywhere. I want you to see that spiritually. Whenever you found yourself in a sin storm, and God has opened your eyes to the blindness. You've confessed that sin, and you're, you're doing your best to live a good life. You know what? That not only is what you've got to get the power back, but then you need to start to clean up. Because listen, if you didn't clean up all those limbs and all those things in your yard, if you didn't clean up that house, there's no way in the world that you could build a house back on that foundation. You first got to clean it all up. You've got to pick up those limbs and, and that the storm has blown out. Because if you don't, all you're going to do is continually trip over them. I'm talking about this spiritually. Whenever something happens generally as a preacher, there's some things, listen, there's some things that I can't do anything about. Absolutely. The, the, the difference is and the challenge for you is, is to know the things that you can do something about and do them and leave the rest in the hands of the Lord. Do not lay awake at night and worry about the things that you cannot do anything about. But listen, if you're here today and you have sin in your life and you're trying to live right and you have neglected to take care of some things that's laying in your yard, you better get them cleaned up. You're not going to move forward with God and, for your, and with your Christian life. You're not going to have the power of God until you do that. Amen. There's some people that you, listen. You don't. They don't have to forgive you, but you need to forgive them. Amen. There's some forgiveness that needs to just turn loose and say, you know what? I'm not going to allow this to hold me back. You owe me nothing. I forgive you and turn that loose. There's some the rectifications going to have to be made. You know, if you've took from somebody, you need to go back and make that right. Amen. You need to make that right. Amen. You know, I don't. God tell you what you need to do. 
Uh, we've, all, we've all got things. Hey, man, listen, we've all got a front porch we need to clean off, amen? We all do. Not only is the power out, not only is there trash and debris that we need to be picked up, but one thing that we have to admit, when a sin storm comes by, watch this now. You ever notice that I've seen, seen rivers reroute because of storms. Landscapes completely changed. Houses wiped out. Preacher, are you, are you talking about? I'm, I'm talking, whenever I'm talking about a sin storm, if you've never been through one, you don't know what I'm talking about. But if you hang on, I'm not talking about, and I'm not calling them petty sins, but these sins that you commit because of the flesh every day, you, you don't say something right, you, you, you miss say something, you don't do things, you, you're faithful. I'm talking about whenever Satan takes you down to the hog pen. Amen? You get so far away from God, you don't feel, look, smell, or sound saved. You're in the middle of a sin storm. It takes a while to get back to God. Amen? Oh, He'll forgive you. He'll clean you up. But you're going to have to deal with the fallout. Amen? That's the responsibility. But notice, the rivers are rerouted, the houses are destroyed, the landscape has changed. What are you saying, preacher? I said sometimes things will never be the same. All right. Sometimes whenever we allow sin to come into our life, things will never be the same. But child of God, listen. I want you to rejoice over this fact. God has never left you. God is right there. You know what he's going to do? He's going to build you up. You start repenting. You start, start turning back to him. He said, then will I hear from heaven. Hey, man, I'll forgive their sin. And I'll heal their land. Amen. He and I know that. I don't believe it'll ever be the same. Not in my lifetime over what we've been through over the six or eight weeks. People's going to be reluctant to shake hands and hug, reluctant to do those things. And, and rightfully so, I understand those. Maybe there's some things when they did a bit we need to show love. Amen. There's some things that we need to do. But you know what? Things, are going to, things will be different. Verse number 24 tells us that. I want you to see that. I'll look right over. We're going to close, I promise. Over to verse number 24 of our text, chapter 12. Notice the Bible says that and after this, after all this had taken place, the baby had died. David got up and washed himself. Verse number 24 says this, And David comfort, comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in to her and lay with her, and she bare a son, and he called his name who? Solomon. Solomon, he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. Notice what God done. Whenever David repented, oh my, if you've ever, if you've ever messed up, messed up big time. I mean, you hit it out of the park. And you sinned, you was blind to it, but you found her with God through his providence and through his love and through his grace. Reached out and sent Nathan to knock on your heart's door and told you you're the man and you fell down and you asked God to forgive you. You know what? All the power had to come back. Hey man, listen. Not all the power had to come back. You had to clean up some things. You had to pick up some things. Make some things right. Hey, listen, you can't go back and do things over again. But that does not mean with God we can go forward. And that it may be different, but it can still be good. Amen. Oh, King Solomon. God loved him. Look what King Solomon does. This was David and Bathsheba. God used to bring the greatest king, the wisest king, the one that even built the temple to the land, to the people. That's what God can do. But only God will do that whenever we repent of our sin. Oh my God, he's ready to forgive. But do not, for your sake, for your family's sake, for the sake of the cause of Christ, do not allow Satan to blind you that to every action is an equal and opposite reaction. In other words, for everything that you do, it has a response. It affects someone. Every look, every glimpse, every glare, every word carries with it a punch. Amen? Be responsible. For there's consequences, good or bad. I'd love to spend some time on the laws of the harvest. God is not mocked. Amen? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. That that you sow, you surely shall reap. I love you. Child of God, I pray for you. This message should exalt you, should lift you up. 
And, and do not, please do not allow Satan to continually have you looking back in the things that you have done in your past. Ask God to search your heart. Try the reins of your heart. If there's anything in your life, any of the debris, any of those leftover things that you can fix, I believe you ought to do it. With the help of God, you ought to do it. But if you can't, there's things that you can't repair and you can't go back. Quit wallowing in that and allow Satan to keep you held back. David and Bathsheba, because his repentance and because he was, he was willing to acknowledge his sin, God in turn was able to bless him. Things were not the same. It was different, but it does not mean it can't be good. He can use you. Amen. He used old uh, Saul, changed his name to Paul. Amen. Used old Peter. Amen. You used uh, the, uh, John uh, the Baptist. Amen. He used them all. Amen. He can use you. Amen. I love you. And if you're, if you're lost here today, I want you to know that Jesus Christ loves you. You're lost today not because you're a bad person. Please hear that. It's not because you're a bad person that you do the things that are wrong. It's because that's your nature. But you have the responsibility because God has also put in you a conscience. God has told you and showed you in your heart. You don't need me to tell you what's right and wrong. You know that. Amen. You know what? You tell me that you know it whenever you come and ask me if something's all right or not. Something's already telling you that it's wrong and you would never need to ask. You don't need the friends. You don't need the law to tell you that. God's wrote that on your heart and you know it. When you sin against him, there's prices and there's consequences. And you know what? Whenever we sin, we're separated between God. Jesus Christ has paid the sin debt. If you receive him, do you know what he does? He reaches out and grabs you by your hand. Lives, grab you by your hand. He's at one with the Father, holding on to the Father. And now because of Jesus Christ, the man in the middle, you're at one with, with God the Father again. Never be separated. But be, uh, beware. And hear me and hear me well. You continue to condone sin, have pleasure in them that do them, and you're either for God or you're against God. There's no middle ground. You can't cruise along the fence. You can't ride the split rail fence. I'll, I'll tell you, beg you not to do that. Amen. It's like I heard a preacher say, the only, uh, the only uh, thing that I've ever seen in the middle of the road is uh, two yellow streaks and a dead skunk. Amen. So as a child of God, let us stay on the side of the word of God. Let God's word be true. Never man else a liar. Let us pray together. You bow. I want you to ask God to search your heart. And if you're, if you're not saved, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, would you call upon him and just pray a prayer of repentance? Just, just tell him, say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I can't live good enough. I know that Jesus Christ died for me. You love me enough to send your son to die on the cross at Calvary. And if you have faith and trust and believe in that prayer, you can, you can too be saved. Let's pray to Heavenly Father. We love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the message. And Lord, I know to Heavenly Father I'm little myself, uh, but what I speak of, is great and mighty things, powerful things. And God, it's able to overthrow mountains. And Lord, it's able to, uh, to, to cause the downfall of kings. And Lord, you're able to rise up leaders that will lead, uh, Lord, in a way that be pleasing to you. And God, that's my prayer. And God, that we, you would send men that will stand on the word of God, that will stand and call this country back to a place of repentance, that we may have the healing of the Lamb, Lord, through and by our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for salvation. Lord, we thank you for saving us. Thank you for keeping us saved. We thank you for all those that are listening, all those that will listen. And God, I pray that you would just love them up, protect them, keep them safe. That one that's discouraged, encourage them, strengthen them. And God, I heal those that are sick. Bless those in our prayer box. God, you know every need. And Lord, till we meet again, I pray that you take care and keep us all safe. Make it possible, Lord, in the near future that we could assemble back together safely as a church. I know it's your will, but God, you're showing us some things. Lord, help us to learn. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, I want to thank you for joining us and I ask you to continue to pray for us as we go throughout the week. 
And uh, you pray for uh, our deacons, and I pray that uh, we would all make the decisions to lead the church. Uh, we're already in the process of coming up with some ideas uh, in the transition that we can come back to worship together. Now, it might be a gradual transition, just like the way we went into it. Uh, so we're trying to make preparations the best way that we can uh, to be ready uh, that we can come together and worship. Until then, uh, have a good day, and God bless you all.